Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. I think um, just like two minutes ago, I think there were just four of us. And he said, I guess we have a small group today. And then, then a lot of folks came down. That built my, uh, my, my encouragement. I appreciate it. Um, we're, we're kind of in that, remember we set our, settled our uh, study on theology of suffering early. We finished about four weeks early. So we're in these four weeks where we're just kind of looking at random things and di different topics. Um, and especially today, because in the sermon we were looking at gray areas, right, when it comes to sin. And what what's our desire? What do we want? We want to know what exactly can I do and what can't I do? We want it all laid out. And that was, in fact, that's how Judaism shape, took shape. Right. God gave the law in the book of Moses, and then, then they, had, they developed all of these other books and writings trying to narrow down every possible detail so that people knew exactly what they could do and what they couldn't do. So like uh, the third commandment, is remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy so you don't you don't work on the Sabbath. So then the, somebody had to say, well, what constitutes work? Well, um, you can't walk more than, what was it, a seventh of a mile from your house. If you're walking more than that, then you're working on the Sabbath. Well, then what constitutes your house? It's where you eat. <coughs> So the day before the Sabbath, if they had to go somewhere, they'd go and they'd drop a piece of bread every seventh of a mile, right, so along the routes. You see how the, see how our minds work? We want to get it all sorted out and figured out, and God's Word just doesn't always yield itself to that. Growth and maturity realizes that there are, um, that there are principles given and angles and perspectives that all have to be weighed, and sin does not yield itself often to just... Here's the line. This is a sin. This is not. This is not. It's a sin. Um, I was. I, th I thought. You know, a good example of that is uh, Halloween. We're coming up on Halloween, right? So, can a Christian celebrate Halloween? Well, I don't think we should ever celebrate Halloween. Right? Ha Halloween is All Hallowed's Day. It's the day before All Saints' Day. But, but Halloween itself, the what it has become. I don't think. Christians to celebrate. Um, but can we participate in it? Sure. Well, what's the resounding answer? What? I think the best answer is it depends. <laughs> right? Yeah. Can you can you have pumpkins and corn shocks? And can Paisley dress up, you know, like a like a Horse? farm animal or something and <laughs> Go and collect candy. Okay, so like the Americans have been asking, so but it's like it's one thing your kid dresses up, but they're gonna go out and they're gonna see all these people dressed as these demonic. See, and look at that's, like, that's what I'm telling them and I don't know what to, to do. Oh. Like, but you're thinking theologically, that's good. <laughs> yeah, so there there's a lot more to it, right? There a certain and, and, and there seems to be Kind of a spectrum, right? So, would you hang like witches and skeletons and ghosts outside your house? I don't know. I don't think a Christian should do that. For one thing, witchcraft. The Bible's very, very clear that that is an abomination to the Lord. And people say, "Well, I don't really believe in it. I'm not really doing it." Well, what, it's like somebody says, you know. Uh, I don't, I don't really believe in adultery. I just like playing this fantasy game where I talk about it and think about it. And you go, no, something's wrong with you, pal. Right? Um, you, you, you can't touch that stuff. In fact, oh, I wasn't going to have you do this, but as long as we're on it. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 
4, excuse me, Ephesians uh, 5. Yeah. Ephesians 5, verse 6. Five verse six. Got it? Ephesians 5, 6. But no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them. So we can't do anything that partners with sin. Verse 8, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. What does it mean to discern? What is discern? It's all good, yeah, to, to, to try to understand better, to try to distinguish. Um, so Christians have to be discerning people. That means it's just not always going to be obvious to us what the right thing is to do and what the wrong thing is to do. It takes discernment to try to understand it. Like like Maria, that's so beautiful, right? She's, she's thinking, all right, be okay for my daughter to do it, but then my daughter's in a crowd with other people who are doing it in excess. And how does how does that play into it? That's that's using discernment, right? Just trying to trying to think through it. That's good. Verse eleven. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Um, so Christians are people. We don't we don't say where's the line that God draws so we can see how close we can get to the line. Um, I remember when I was, oh, I'm always telling stories, sorry about that. When I was first a brand new pastor in uh, Wyndham, Minnesota, and I was busy all week, and so after church, I was thinking I'll cut the grass, and I got out there, and all of a sudden I realized all my neighbors know, hey, that guy's the new pastor in town. And there I'll be on Sunday cutting the grass <laughs> and the Sabbath, right? Is, is it a sin to cut grass on the Sabbath? I've been a sinner. <laughs> What's that? I said I've been a sinner a long time. Al's <laughs> yeah. confessing, right? <laughs> you could have calculated a seventh of a mile. And just there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I had a seventh of a mile. But you see how there's other issues that come in? It's not just, I can do this. It's, um, what is the impact this is going to have on other people? What will they think? How will that, not, not that we worry about what other people think in the sense of that we're trying to impress anybody, but we're concerned about how this affects their, their own relationship with God or possibility of, of one. Um, so it's it's a it's a tough thing to do. So let's uh, let's turn to uh, First Corinthians chapter eight. Wait, did you fall? I, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> we did it after church, of course. Oh, this would be after church. Yeah. yeah. Where's Pastor? Well, he'll be here as soon as he's done with the yard. No. <laughs> I'll tell you another story about that. Um, that church was mostly all older people, my first church. And so when I would get to church, and I was the first one there every Sunday, I would park all the way down at the far end of the, the parking lot. And um, we had two people, they never did become members, they, were, they never joined the church. But they came off and on for, for my first year or two there, and then they started coming every week. But one day they called me aside and they said, you know, you know what got us started coming to this church every week? They said, where you park? <laughs> Apparently the pastor that was there previous to me took the first spot, right in the, right in the middle. Um, now, did he have a right to that spot? Yeah, he's a pastor. He was the first one there. Um, but he's, he's thinking about the other folks and, and those that, that one couple, they noticed that. Yeah, that, that said something to them. So, so thinking about how what we do influences and affects other people. 
and it's not hard. None of us are perfect at it. We have to grow in our discernment. So let's let that that considered. Let's look at First Corinthians chapter eight. Is it okay if I read, or are you sick of my voice? <laughs> now concerning food offered to idols. We know that, in quotes, all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God, for we are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you, who have knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, Will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. All right, look at how he's, see how he's discerning and he's thinking theologically about something. It's not a, just a question of is this right or is this wrong. That's, that's the kind of knowledge that he talks about that puffs up. There's more to it than this. So uh, what was the, the practice back in those days? You had, you had all these false gods and living in, living in Corinth would have been really hard if you were a Christian because everything in town was dedicated to a god. So if you went to the, um, the public bathhouse, you, did, you didn't have showers in your house. They didn't have that back then. They had a public bathhouse. And when you needed to bathe, you went to the bathhouse. But the bathhouse was dedicated to, I don't know this for a fact who it was, but let's just say Aphrodite, the goddess Aphrodite. Um, so if you're in there taking a bath, in a bathhouse dedicated to Aphrodite, are you sinning? Are you somehow acknowledging or recognizing Aphrodite or giving her some kind of honors? Um, the, the toilets. I've, I've shared, have I shared this before? Yeah. <laughs> I was, when I went to Ephesus, I should have brought the picture of it. Um, we went to Ephesus. It's such a good thing. If you ever get a chance to tour the Holy Land and see these things, it's really amazing. So um, they had public toilets, and they're still there. Yeah. The roof is gone, so nobody uses them. <laughs> but you can still go, and you see this long, long granite thing with holes cut out. And then underneath that was like a water trough, and they channeled water so that water would flow through. This is kind of gross, but yeah. may as well say it, right? They, they had slaves underneath there. Their job was oh. to clean you. <laughs> and the, uh, that was, that was a, I was told by the, our guide that that was actually a privileged position. If you were a slave and you could get the job of cleaning the people in the latrines, that's what you wanted. Because every once in a while you would overhear them conversing and they would say something that they shouldn't have said, you know, like they were having an affair or something like that, and then the slave could say, I'm going to tell your wife. <laughs> and a lot of times the slaves would get there for you. But the, the, the latrines are dedicated to a certain god. The stores are dedicated to God. Everything is dedicated to a God. So how do you live 
in a place where everything around you is um, unholy? Well, that's a good question for us in 2024, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, every, everywhere you go, all around you is stuff that's, that's unholy. It's, it's, it's amazing how, how it's thrown in our faces. Well, so they had to figure out a way to live in this. <laughs> And so for the Jews, they said, okay, well, you, you can't help living there, and you can't help using these facilities. You have to do it. But don't worship those gods. We all agree on that, right? Mm -hmm. And they said, don't, if, if meat or food gets offered as a sacrifice to those gods, don't, don't eat it. Because participating in the meal that's sacrificed at an altar causes you to share in that altar. That's also, we won't take time to look at it, but Paul teaches that in Corinthians, and we apply that as Missouri Synod Lutherans. How? The Lord's Supper. The yeah. Lord's Supper, right. When someone eats the food that is offered at an altar, they share in that altar. So someone should not share in that altar unless they are in agreement with all that is taught there and the God that is being worshipped and taught there. So that's one reason why we practice close communion. So the Jews were very worried about that. The meat would get offered. So they would have a sacrifice. Let's say you're going to sacrifice to Zeus and you're nice and wealthy so you bring a big ox and you sacrifice this ox to Zeus and they have their ceremony and everything but then what did they do? Well they're butchering it and they cut it up and they roast it and they eat it and if there's extra meat left over they, they yeah they sell it and that's how they make money for the temple of Zeus so you're walking down the road and you go into the butcher shop um, in the butcher shop you might have an animal that was sacrificed the normal way but you might also have meat for sale that had been sacrificed to Zeus or somebody somebody else so the Jews had to be very careful of that so that they wouldn't eat food that was sacrificed to a, a false god because then they're participating and sharing in the altar with that false god. Well, how would they know which is which? They have to ask. You have to ask. Um, here's Paul now. And Paul says, all right, we know that there's many gods. Did you see it with a small g when I read it? Were you watching it? There's many gods and many lords, and we know that they're nothing. That's interesting because in another place in 1 Corinthians, he says behind the idols are de demons. Yeah. But, but when it comes to them being actual gods, he says no, they don't exist. They're, they're nothing. It does, if you sacrifice meat to an idol, it's, it's nothing. It's just like regular meat. So for the Christians, could you eat meat that had been sacrificed to an idol? Yes. But um, if, let's say you have now someone who was Jewish and they have converted to Christianity. They've recognized that Christ is the Messiah. They've become a Christian and they've joined the church. What are they accustomed to? What are they used to? You can't eat that. So let's say you sit down at dinner and the, the Jewish convert to Christianity says to you, that meat they just put on your plate, that was offered to Zeus. Why is he telling you that? Because he, in his background, you're not supposed to eat it. He's afraid if you eat it, you're sinning. And so what does Paul say here? Can you eat it? Yes, technically. But should you eat it? No. no. Why? Right. 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 If you're going to cause a needless offense. Yeah, don't cut it. Yeah. Right. You're going to cause a needless offense. That, that fellow's going to look at you eating that and he's going to think you don't care about participating with Zeus and, and he'll be he'll be hurt and, or maybe he'll feel obligated that he eats it and now he feels 
guilty. And so what does Paul say about that in that situation? Look at this. Again, um, verse 11. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, this brother for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. So all of a sudden, this thing that is perfectly okay to do, it's not a problem whatsoever, now he calls it a sin. It is a sin. So there's another dimension to this. So all of these things, I talk about these gray areas. The gray areas are those things where it's hard to just say this is a sin, this is not a sin, but there's a lot of factors that, that um, collide and come together in trying to, to determine this, um, to figure this out. Um, what might be some things today? Well, I, I should say this. The, the issue here is a, causing a, an offense to your brother. Is it ever okay to cause an offense? That's a tricky question. So I, I wait, so lots of silence here. For me, so. <laughs> is it ever okay to cause an offense? To your brother or to anybody? In fact, it's, I guess anybody. It's, it's, this same, go ahead. So I would think if, if your brother is, as you say, but in the wrong on something, it's going to be offensive to correct him per se. Um, but you're doing it for his own good. Yes. Because you love him. In this same book here again in Corinthians, Paul talks about how Christ and the gospel are an offense, a stumbling block. And so by preaching the gospel, you're going to offend people. I was reading about somebody that went to one of these mega churches. I'm not I'm trying to blast all mega churches. I haven't been in a while. I don't know. But this, he was in one, and he said the only thing he noticed was that there's um, a, a, a clear podium made of plexiglass for the person to speak, and there's drum sets, and there's plastic plants. But he says he looked around. There's no altar. There's no cross. And so he asked about it, and he was told that they had decided at that church that a lot of people might be offended to see the cross, so they decided not to put it in. Think about that for a second. That's, that's like throwing out the gospel. <laughs> I understand the mission of mega churches. They want to reach more people, reach more people, but you're reaching more people by throwing out what you're all about, what's central. Um, there are times where we're going to cause an offense. Um, correcting someone. How should we correct people, by the way? In Speaking love. the... Yeah. Ephesians yeah. says. Who said it? Speaking the... Truth in Speaking love. the truth in, in love. Right. So, to say, brother, we, we've decided that you're really messing up here. You're going to have to straighten out. That's not the right approach. Right? Um, and that takes work. Does that? Do you know how to do that right away? No, that takes discerning to learn <laughs> how to approach people and how to how to, how to help them. But that's going to cause an offense. So the offense that Paul's talking about here, what kind of offense is this? It's, it's a needless offense over issues of conscience, <coughs> over issues where we have freedom, um, but we don't want to bind people's consciences. So should I as a pastor tell people, don't commit adultery? Should I tell people, don't steal, right? I sh of course I should tell people that. Um, should I tell people, don't mow your lawns on Sundays? Or this Halloween, you may not wear uh, sweaters with pumpkins on them, right? <laughs> I, I, those, those are matters of freedom of conscience, right? So I'm binding your conscience and causing an offense, and that would be, that would be wrong. So I wanted you to see how there are these areas where they take discernment, they take growth, they take learning more and more of what the, what the Bible says to think about it scripturally and thoughtfully. That's why I'm glad you're here. Um, you don't just come to Bible study and you learn a bunch of facts and data and check it off and say, now I've got it. All right, I got, this is my last minute. There was a, there was a great fellow in my, old, in my old church in Virginia. He was a, a prior Marine. And 
a short Marine. There's, no, there's nothing better than a, a short, retired Marine. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys, are, they're just like little... <laughs> you gotta love them. You gotta love them. They're so awesome. And he never missed church. He was in church every Sunday, no matter what. But he never came to Bible study. And I asked him one time, I said, George, you know, would you like to come to Bible study? Why don't you join us for Bible study? He said, many years ago, I went to a three-year session where we went through the Bible. He said, so I know all that now. <laughs> <laughs> That's not why you're here, right? You're, you're sharpening your tools of discernment. You're learning better how to walk in, in the Lord. I'm grateful for that. Let's close with a word of prayer, and we'll close right away. I don't see Paul, but I think we could. Oh, there. One very confirmed. Oh, okay, so it's going to be a while. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So let, let's just have table grace, though, so people can Absolutely. start when, when it yeah. comes. Sounds right. All right. I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. I thank you that you are at work in their lives, that your Holy Spirit is moving within them. And we know not how the, the Spirit moves, like the wind. We see the signs of it, but we don't know whether it comes and whether it goes. And, we, we see those signs, O oh Lord, in the people who have hearts that are hungry for more of your word. And so I thank you for each of my brothers and sisters here, and those that will be watching the, the video later this week. And I ask your blessing upon them. I ask your, uh, that you would prosper this process of growing in discernment and wisdom. And help us, O oh Lord, to hate the things that are of the darkness and the things that are unrighteous and to love the things that are of you, to be able to know the difference in our very complex and conflicted world. We also thank you, Lord, for 60 years of ministry at this church, and as we share together in the fellowship of our, our food, um, we, we pray that you would bless it to our body's use, and that you are ble would bless our time with one another. We especially, especially pray that you would bless the children, that they would find joy and delight in being here in your house and being with one another and in, in learning about Christ, that we can pass on this very precious faith to the generation that follows. In Christ's name, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, everybody. I guess so we have a half hour. What are we going to do, Paul? Song and dance? I don't know. <laughs> I can't sing and I can't dance. Oh,